Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. Wrenching disorientation. That was how it felt to walk out of Platform 9 and 3 quarters into the rest of Earth. The world that Harry had once thought was the only real world. People dressed in casual shirts and pants instead of the more dignified robes of wizards and witches. The ambiance of the King's Cross train station, less bright and cheerful than Hogwarts or Diagon Alley. The people seemed smaller, more afraid, and likely would have eagerly traded their problems for a dark wizard to fight. Harry wanted to cast Scourgeify for the dirt, and Averto for the garbage, and if he'd known the spell, a bubblehead charm so he wouldn't have to breathe the air. But he couldn't use his wand in this place. This, Harry realized, must be what it felt like to go from a first world country to a third world country. Only it was the zeroth world which Harry had left, the wizarding world, of cleansing charms and house elves. Where, between the healer's arts and your own magic, you could hit 170 before old age really started catching up with you. And non-magical London, Muggle Earth, to which Harry had temporarily returned. This was where Mum and Dad would live out the rest of their lives. Unless technology leapfrogged over wizardry's quality of life, or something deeper in the world changed. And then there was the other reason for the tight feeling in his chest. His parents didn't know. They didn't know anything. They didn't know. Harry, called a thin, blonde woman whose perfectly smooth and unblemished skin made her look a good deal younger than 33. And Harry realized with a start that it was magic. He hadn't known the signs before, but he could see them now. And whatever sort of potion lasted that long, it must have been terribly dangerous, because most witches didn't do that to themselves. They weren't that desperate. There was water gathering in Harry's eyes. He couldn't speak. He couldn't speak at all. They came over to him, not running, but at a steady, dignified walk. That was how fast Professor Michael Varus Evans walked, and Mrs. Petunia Evans Varus wasn't about to walk any faster. The smile on his father's face wasn't very wide, but then his father never was given to huge smiles. It was, at least, as wide as Harry had ever seen it. Wider than when a new grant came in, or when one of his students got a position, and you couldn't ask for a wider smile than that. Mum was blinking hard, and she was trying to smile, but not doing a very good job. So, make any revolutionary discoveries yet? Of course, Dad thought he was joking. It hadn't hurt quite so much when his parents didn't believe in him, back when no one else had believed in him either. Back when Harry hadn't known how it felt to be taken seriously by people like Headmaster Dumbledore and Professor Quirrell. And that was when Harry realized that the boy who lived only existed in magical Britain. That there wasn't any such person in Muggle London. Just a cute little 11-year-old boy going home for Christmas. Excuse me. I'm going to break down and cry now. It doesn't mean there was anything wrong at school. Harry started to move forward and then stopped, torn between hugging his father and hugging his mother. He didn't want either one to feel slighted or that Harry loved them more than the other. You are a very silly boy, Mr. Varys. 
and he gently took Harry by the shoulders and pushed him into the arms of his mother, who was kneeling down, tears already streaking her cheeks. Hello, Mum. I'm back. And Harry started crying, because he knew that nothing could go back, least of all him. The sky was completely dark and the stars were coming out by the time they negotiated the Christmas traffic to the university town that was Oxford and parked in the driveway of the small, dingy-looking old house that their family used to keep the rain off their backs. And then the front door opened and Harry stepped into their living room, blinking hard. The Varys household was just as he'd left it, only with more books, which was also just how he'd left it. And a Christmas tree, naked and undecorated just two days before Christmas Eve, which threw Harry briefly before he realized, with a warm feeling blossoming in his chest, that of course his parents had waited. We took the bed out of your room to make room for more bookcases. You can sleep in your trunk, right? You could sleep in my trunk. That reminds me, what did they end up doing about your sleep cycles? Magic, Harry said, making a beeline for the door that opened upon his bedroom, just in case Dad wasn't joking. That's not an explanation said Professor Varus Evans, just as Harry shouted, You used up all the open space on my bookcases! Some of December 24th had been spent with the professor reading Harry's books and asking questions. Most of the experiments his father had suggested were impractical, at least for the moment. Of those remaining, Harry had done many of them already. Yes, Dad, I checked what happened if Hermione was given a changed pronunciation and she didn't know whether it was changed. That was the very first experiment I did, Dad. The last question Harry's father had asked, looking up from magical draughts and potions with an expression of bewildered disgust, was whether it all made sense if you were a wizard, and Harry had answered no. Whereupon his father had declared that magic was unscientific. Harry was still a little shocked at the idea of pointing to a section of reality and calling it unscientific. Dad seemed to think that the conflict between his intuitions and the universe meant that the universe had a problem. Then again, there were lots of physicists who thought that quantum mechanics was weird, instead of quantum mechanics being normal and them being weird. Harry had shown his mother the healer's kit he'd bought to keep in their house, though most of the potions wouldn't work on Dad. Mum had stared at the kit in a way that made Harry ask whether Mum's sister had ever bought anything like that for Grandpa Edwin and Grandma Elaine. And when Mum still hadn't answered, Harry had said hastily that she must have just never thought of it. And then, finally, he'd fled the room. Lily Evans probably hadn't thought of it. That was the sad thing. Harry knew that other people had a tendency to not think about painful subjects, in the same way they had a tendency not to deliberately rest their hands on red-hot stove burners. And Harry was starting to suspect that most Muggleborns rapidly acquired a tendency to not think about their family, who were all going to die before they reached their first century anyway. Not that Harry had any intention of letting that happen, of course. And then it was late in the day on December 24th, and they were driving off for their Christmas Eve dinner. Dr. Roberta Granger was feeling rather nervous as dinner approached. The turkey and the roast, their own contributions to the common project, were steadily cooking away in the oven. The other dishes were to be brought by their guests, the Varus family, who had adopted a boy named Harry, who was known to the wizarding world as the boy who lived, and who was the only boy that Hermione had ever called cute or noticed at all, really. The Varuses had said that Hermione was the only child in Harry's age group whose existence their son had ever acknowledged in any way whatsoever. And it might have been jumping the gun just a little, but both couples had a sneaking suspicion that wedding bells might be in the offing a few years down the road. So while Christmas Day would be spent, as always, with her husband's family, they decided to spend Christmas Eve meeting their daughter's possible future in-laws. The house was huge. Not by Hogwarts standards, but certainly by the standards of what you could get if your father was a distinguished professor trying to live in Oxford. Harry took a deep breath and rang the doorbell. There was a distant call of, Honey, can you get it? This was followed by a slow patter of approaching steps. And then the door opened to reveal a genial man, of fat and rosy cheeks and thinning hair, in a blue button-down shirt straining slightly at the seams. Dr. Granger, I'm Michael, and this is Petunia and our son Harry. The food's in the magical trunk. Yes, please come in. Have a seat, eh? His head turning down to address Harry. All the toys are downstairs in the basement. 
I'm sure Herm will be down shortly. Harry just looked at him for a moment, conscious that he was blocking his parents from coming in. Toys? I love toys! There was an intake of breath from his mother behind him, and Harry strode into the house, managing not to stomp too hard as he walked. Gosh! This is a big house! I hope I don't get lost in here! Roberta closed up the oven, smiling. She'd been a bit worried about the way Hermione's letters had described the boy who lived. Though certainly her daughter hadn't said anything indicating that Harry Potter was dangerous. Nothing like the dark hints written in the books Roberta had bought, supposedly for Hermione, during their trip to Diagon Alley. Her daughter hadn't said much at all, only that Harry talked like he came out of a book, and Hermione was studying harder than she ever had in her life just to stay ahead of him in class. But from the sound of it, Harry Potter was an ordinary 11-year-old boy. She got to the front door just as her daughter came clattering frantically down the stairs at a speed that didn't look safe at all. Hermione had claimed that witches were more resistant to falls, but Roberta wasn't quite sure she believed that. Roberta took her first sight of Professor and Mrs. Varys, who were both looking rather nervous, just as the boy with the legendary scar on his forehead turned to her daughter and said, Well met on this fairest of evenings, Miss Granger. I present to you my father, Professor Michael Varys Evans, and my mother, Mrs. Petunia Evans Varys. And as Roberta's mouth was gaping open, the boy turned back to his parents and said, now in that bright voice again, Mom? Dad? This is Hermione. She's really smart! Harry, stop that! The boy swiveled again to regard Hermione. I'm afraid, Miss Granger, that you and I have been exiled to the labyrinthine recesses of the basement. Let us leave them to their adult conversations, which would no doubt soar far above our own childish intellects, and resume our ongoing discussion of the implications of human projectivism for transfiguration. Roberta swiveled helplessly to track them as they went past her. The boy gave her a cheery wave. And then Hermione pulled the boy into the basement access and slammed the door behind her. I, uh, I apologize for... I'm sorry. Harry can be a bit touchy about that sort of thing. But I expect he's right about us not being interested in their conversation. Is he dangerous? Roberta wanted to ask, but she kept her silence and tried to think of subtler questions. Her husband was chuckling, as if he'd found what they'd just seen funny rather than frightening. The most terrible Dark Lord in history had tried to kill that boy, and the burnt husk of his body had been found next to the crib. Her possible future son-in-law. Roberta put her best smile on her face and did what she could to spread some pretended Christmas cheer. The dining room table was much longer than six people. Their four people and two children really needed. Harry was having a bit of trouble concentrating on the turkey. The conversation had turned to Hogwarts, naturally, and it'd been obvious to Harry that his parents were hoping that Hermione would trip up and say more about Harry's school life than Harry had been telling them. And either Hermione had realized this, or she was just automatically steering clear of anything that might prove troublesome. So Harry was fine. But unfortunately, Harry had made the mistake of owling his parents with all sorts of facts about Hermione that she hadn't told her own parents. Like that she was general of an army in their after-school activities. Hermione's mother had looked very alarmed, and Harry had quickly interrupted and done his best to explain that all the spells were stunners, Professor Quirrell was always watching, and the existence of magical healing meant that lots of things were much less dangerous than they sounded. At which point, Hermione had kicked him hard under the table. Thankfully, Harry's father, who Harry had to admit was better than him at some things, had announced with firm professorial authority that he hadn't worried at all, since he couldn't imagine children being allowed to do it if it was dangerous. That wasn't why Harry was having trouble enjoying dinner, though. The problem with feeling sorry for yourself was that it never took any time at all to find someone else who had it worse. Dr. Leo Granger had asked, at one point, whether that nice teacher who'd seemed to like Hermione, Professor McGonagall, was awarding her lots of points in school. Hermione had said yes with an apparently genuine smile. Harry had managed, with some effort, to stop himself from icily pointing out that Professor McGonagall would never show favoritism to any Hogwarts student, and that Hermione was getting lots of points because she'd earned every single one. At another point, Leo Granger had offered the table his opinion that Hermione was very smart, and could have gone to medical school and become a dentist, if not for the whole witch business. 
Hermione had smiled again, and a quick glance had prevented Harry from suggesting Hermione might also have been an internationally famous scientist, and asking whether that thought would have occurred to the Grangers if they'd had a son instead of a daughter, or if it was unacceptable either way for their offspring to do better than them. But Harry was rapidly reaching his boiling point, and becoming a lot more appreciative of the fact that his own father had always done everything he could to support Harry's development as a prodigy, and always encouraged him to reach higher, and never belittled a single one of his accomplishments, even if a child prodigy was still just a child. Was this the sort of household he could have ended up in if Mum had married Vernon Dursley? Harry was doing what he could, though. And she's really beating you in all your classes, except broomstick riding and transfiguration? Yes, by solid margins in most of them. There were other circumstances under which Harry would have been more reluctant to admit that, which was why he hadn't gotten around to telling his father until now. Hermione has always been quite good in school. Harry competes at the national level. Dear! Hermione was giggling, and that wasn't making Harry feel any better about her situation. It didn't seem to bother Hermione, and that bothered Harry. I'm not embarrassed to lose to her, Dad. Did I mention that she memorized all her school books before the first day of class? And yes, I tested it. Is that usual for her? Oh yes, Hermione is always memorizing things. She knows every recipe in all my cookbooks by heart. I miss her every time I make dinner. Judging by the look on his father's face, Dad was feeling at least some of what Harry felt. Don't worry, Dad. She's getting all the advanced material she can take now. Her teachers at Hogwarts know she's smart. Unlike her parents! His voice had risen on the last three words, and even as all faces turned to stare at him and Hermione kicked him again, Harry knew that he'd blown it. But it was just too much. Just way too much! Of course we know she's smart. You don't have the tiniest idea. You think she reads a lot of books and it's cute, right? You see a perfect report card and you think it's good that she's doing well in class. Your daughter is the most talented witch of her generation and the brightest star of Hogwarts. And someday, Dr. and Dr. Granger, the fact that you were her parents will be the only reason that history remembers you. Hermione, who had calmly got up from her seat and walked around the table, chose that moment to grab Harry's shirt by the shoulder and pull him out of his chair. Harry let himself be pulled, but as Hermione dragged him away, he said, raising his voice even louder, It's entirely possible that in a thousand years, the fact that Hermione Granger's parents were dentists will be the only reason anyone remembers dentistry! Roberta stared at where her daughter had just dragged the boy who lived out of the room with a patient look upon her young face. I'm terribly sorry, but please don't worry. Harry always talks like that. Aren't they just like a married couple already? The frightening thing was that they were. Harry had been expecting a rather severe lecture from Hermione. But after Hermione pulled them into the basement access and closed the door behind them, she turned around and was smiling. Genuinely, so far as Harry could tell. Please don't, Harry. Even though it's very nice of you, everything's fine. How can you stand it? How can you stand it? Because that's the way parents should be? No, it's not. My father never puts me down. Well, he does, but never like that. Harry, Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick like me because I'm the most talented witch of my generation and the brightest star of Hogwarts. And Mom and Dad don't know that, and you'll never be able to tell them, but they love me anyway. Which means that everything is just the way it should be, at Hogwarts and at home. And since they're my parents, Mr. Potter, you don't get to argue. Is that clear, Mr. Potter? Harry nodded tightly. Hey! No kissing! The two fathers burst out in laughter, just as the two mothers rose up from their chairs with identical looks of horror and dashed toward the basement. When the children had been brought back, Hermione was saying in an icy tone that she was never going to kiss Harry ever again. And Harry was saying in an outraged voice that the sun would burn down to a cold, dead cinder before he let her get close enough to try. Which meant that everything was just the way it should be, and they all sat back down again to finish their Christmas dinner.
It was almost midnight. Staying up late was simple enough for Harry. He just hadn't used the time turner. Harry followed a tradition of timing his sleep cycle to make sure he was awake for when Christmas Eve turned into Christmas Day. Because while he'd never been young enough to believe in Santa Claus, he'd once been young enough to doubt. It would have been nice if there had been a mysterious figure who entered your house in the night and brought you presents. A chill went down Harry's spine then, an intimation of something dreadful approaching, a creeping terror, a sense of doom. He looked at the window. Professor Quirrell! Fear not, Mr. Potter. I have charmed your parents asleep. They shall not wake until I have departed. No one's supposed to know where I am. Even owls are supposed to deliver my mail to Hogwarts, not here. Oh, I shouldn't worry, Mr. Potter. You are well protected against locating charms, and no blood purist is likely to think of consulting a phone book. And it did take considerable effort to cross the wards that the headmaster put around this house. Though, of course, anyone who knew your address could simply wait outside and attack you the next time you left. Harry stared at Professor Quirrell for a while. What are you doing here? I've come to apologize, Mr. Potter. I should not have spoken to you so harshly as I... Don't. Just don't. Have I offended you that much? No, but you will if you apologize. I see. Then if I am to treat you as an equal, Mr. Potter, I should say that you have gravely violated the etiquette that holds between friendly Slytherins. If you are not currently playing the game against someone, you must not meddle in their plans like that. Not without asking them before. For you do not know what their true design may be, nor what stakes they may lose. It would mark you as their enemy, Mr. Potter. I'm sorry. Apology accepted. But you and I really must speak further on politics at some point. I know you dislike condescension, Mr. Potter. But it would be even more condescending if I were not to state it clearly. You are missing some life experience, Mr. Potter. And does everyone who has sufficient life experience agree with you, then? What good is life experience to someone who plays Quidditch? I think you will change your mind in time, after every trust you place has failed you and you have become cynical. The defense professor said it as though it were the most ordinary statement in the world, framed against the black and the stars and the cloud-spotted sky, as one or two tiny snowflakes blew past him in the biting winter air. That reminds me. Merry Christmas. I suppose. After all, if it is not an apology, then it must be a Christmas gift. The very first one I have ever given, in fact. Harry hadn't even started yet on learning Latin so he could read the experimental diary of Roger Bacon, and he hardly dared open his mouth to ask. Put on your winter coat, or take a warming potion if you have one, and meet me outside, under the stars. I shall see if I can maintain it a little longer this time. It took Harry a moment to process the words, and then he was dashing for the coat closet. They crossed the boundary from Christmas Eve to Christmas Day within that timeless void where earthly rotations meant nothing. The one, true, everlasting, silent night. 